Hi, I'm Rafael Gutierrez again, and today I'm going to talk about how adrenaline or epinephrine affects the body, in particular in martial arts. Now, before I do that, I did want to talk to all of you who have viewed this before, and thank you. I started this a month ago, and what I've noticed is there's already I've had over 2,000 viewers, almost, almost reaching 3,000 people viewing this, which to me just is amazing. I thought, you know, maybe there would be five of us who were interested in the anatomy and physiology of uh, what happens to the body in martial arts. A lot of my friends have actually encouraged me to do this, uh, saying that we've needed this. And when we start doing reality and we start showing models, martial artists can get interested in science of, of uh, martial arts, if it's done correctly. I hope I'm doing it correctly and uh, you guys agree with me. There are certain things that obviously people are going to disagree with. Some people w might want me to do more of uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Like I always say, I'm not an expert in Chinese medicine. I don't have a doctorate in that, so I'm going to avoid that subject myself. But I think that if people who have doctorates in Chinese medicine could do this, that would be something great. And today, like I said, I'm going to talk about mostly three things in this video. One is the effects of epinephrine, and I'm going to use the Hulk as an example. The other thing is what science is and what it isn't. And the only reason I'm changing this platform a little bit is because, like I said, I'm on vacation. Uh, my, the school I work at is closed, so I can't use their models. But hopefully this will make up for it, and I hope you enjoy the video. Thank you. Hello, it's Rafael Gutierrez again, and while I am losing my models because I'm on vacation, I do want to talk about the effects of adrenaline on the body. But before I do that, I need to tell you guys about what the scientific method is. Now, a lot of people think that sciences are just stuck in a lab and they're mixing chemicals and it's like, Eureka, I found it. And it's a little more, actually a little simpler than that. But at the same time, the simplicity leads to these complex structures later. I'm going to work our, our way backwards from what science is. And I'm going to start with Descartes. Descartes is a philosopher who came up with what they call the scientific method. And he gave us four steps. These four steps were you had an observation. Based on your observation, you go to the next step where you make a hypothesis based on what you saw. So you now have a hypothesis, a working question you can ask. Something happened. The next one is, is what were the triggers to this happening? The third one is testing the hypothesis. Now, when we test something, we don't try to find out if it's true. We try to find out if it's not true. So pretty much what we say is this. Let's say we use the Incredible Hulk. Couldn't every other case that we've researched it's been the same story over and over and over again. What is the common denominator? Yes, I've been wanting to use superheroes. Uh, in the clip of the Incredible Hulk, which show was David Batter, wants to know why he couldn't lift the car while other people could. Because he finds that there is a amount of gamma radiation in the that was released by the sun at that time period, and it mixed with the uh, their genes and their uh, epinephrine, and they were able to get these massive strengths to lift the car. Now, you could say, well, gamma radiation, and with these genes and gamma radiation and uh, epinephrine, you become super strong. Well, that wouldn't, that isn't showing us that it just proves it. So what we have to do is 
we have to take all, all the samples. So in this, David Banner has the genes, he has the epinephrine, and he ends up getting himself with gamma rays. The idea being, if he has all these three go, things go on, he will develop this super strength. Now, if he wasn't able to develop super strengths, we have a, a new theory. You know, gamma radiation with epinephrine and uh, in your body and the genes in your body do not produce super strength. In the, in the TV show, it ends up doing it. And so the uh, theory then will, it becomes that the genes, the adrenaline and the gamma radiations together give you a sudden boost of energy that helps you lift the car. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to disprove it. Now, that's a big thing is we try to disprove everything. And because of the fact that they couldn't get the evidence to disprove it, we accept it. A theory is not, well, it's just a theory. When they talk about scientific theory, it's something that we've tried to disprove and we haven't been able to. Science cannot be stagnant. It always has to be modified based on trying to disprove a new information. I did tell you I was going to talk about epinephrine, and that's why I'm talking about the Incredible Hulk. But now he's, now he's trying to get through the first hatch. The Incredible Hulk is, I'm using him for a couple of reasons. One is, here you have a comic book character and the other which a lot of people love and the other thing is that 70s tv show was so perfect that i don't know anyone who grew up in the u.s during that time period who didn't watch and love love it and still remembers even the song so that's why i'm using the hulk for this now when we're dealing with adrenaline we don't i don't want to start with the effects the you know the anger the rate but what i want to talk about is actually what's up here. Now it controls all your body, all your movement, everything is in your brain. And so I did have a brain model I got when I was in med school. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. Now, you can't, I can't show it to you here too much, but there is a part in your brain here called the hypothalamus. And the thalamus is here. Now the, the hypothalamus and thalamus actually do play a big role in emotions. And if we're dealing with adrenaline, we have to deal with anger, fright. Those are the two big ones, being afraid and being angry. Now, these are, these are really great emotions to have for survival. They're horrible for decision making. What I mean is this. When you're pumped up on adrenaline, you end up doing stuff which gets you out of the situation. But it may not be the best idea you've had. What I mean is, let's say you're being chased by a bear mm -hmm. and uh, you see a ravine. Your mind may say, if I jump over that, if I jumped in that ravine, the bear won't follow me. So you might do it. And then what ends up happening is you're falling and you realize, yeah, the bear's not following me anymore, but now I'm falling down and down to, uh, and plummeting to my death. Well, it got you away though. That's the important thing. So adrenaline, the rage, the anger, the fright, it's interrelated in the uh, emotional centers of the brain, the hypothalamus in particular, and it goes to areas such as this area here called the midbrain, some of the pons, and the medulla oblongata here. And these tracks go down to, go down to the uh, thoracic region where they branch, and they hit something called the sympathetic chain ganglion. A ganglion pretty much is a collection of cell bodies. A bunch of cells over there. And if you look in the chest, if you look in a thoracic area, you'd have two chains on the side of both, on both sides of the vertebrae, and these big lumps where you have cell bodies. Now, these chains work with the, these big lumps, end up connecting with each other and other organs. Now, this, within these cells, you're, act, you're going to be secreting something called acetylcholine. And it's going to go to the cells, and those cells are going to be triggered, and they're going to release a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. Now, that's going to go to a bunch of different areas, and this is what adre this is how adrenaline works. First, I'm going to talk about the respiratory tract. 
When you're scared, one of the things that happens is your nose opens up. Your trachea opens up and dries. Your bronchus dries. And your lungs start being able to breathe more. You, you pretty much go from a small little, a small little tube to a larger tube. It makes it a lot easier to get air in and gets air into the lungs. So you can get more oxygen into the body where you need it and get rid of more carbon dioxide. Now, what that means is you now can break apart more energy. You have all the oxygen you need to get things moving. But it doesn't stop there. It's also, by doing all this, it dries out the air pipe, airway, and so it doesn't allow you to filter as much. But at the time, remember, you're not trying to filter. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get out of there. Your lungs start breathing harder. And so that's one of the big things that happens with epinephrine. That's why when people are a little scared, they breathe better. That's also, by the way, why they use uh, certain types of uh, medicine which look similar to the body to epinephrine for people with asthma. As they have an, a, a reaction, they use uh, beta agonists. Beta are the receptors in the bronchus, and, uh, and it causes a relaxation, so everything opens up. Now, as we go to the heart, as we hit the heart with norepinephrine, the heart has beta two recept beta one receptors, which start beating faster. It also starts beating harder. In essence, it boosts your blood pressure. You increase in blood. You have an increase in blood pressure. You, you have an increase in cardiac output. The heart's beating faster and harder, so blood's moving faster. So what you have is you have more oxygen going to everywhere in your body. So. What, what this means is you now have a mind that's thinking how to fight, just, you know, doesn't really care about the consequences. It's, I need to get out either by fighting or by running away. How do I do it? Again, you're not looking for rational thinking at this point. So a lot of people try to get you to be angry and then have you try to do something. Well, what they're trying to do is make you not be able to think rationally. So, your heart starts racing, your lungs are now working better, and one of the nerves from the sympathetic chain ganglion goes right over your kidneys to the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland, it goes to the inner area called the medulla, and that releases epinephrine. So, so far, what we're talking about is just neural effects. The epinephrine ends up finally going from your kidneys, your adrenal glands, the epinephrine goes from your adrenal gland, and go, floods into your blood. Now it's going to go everywhere but you still have neurons, nerve cells, going every part of your body. For instance, your digestive tract is getting hit by epinephrine. And what that usually does is it stops. That's why a lot of diet pills use things that are similar to epinephrine. They slow down your GI tract, so you feel a little more full, you don't feel hungry. It's also why when you're really nervous, some people don't feel hungry. Another place that this goes is it, it does have roots to go into the liver. It does have roots to go to... Uh, various areas and in the liver it ends up getting getting something called a gluconeogenesis to occur gluco it technically means glucose it's sugar neo means new genesis means beginning so you start making new sugars and these are going to flood your body so now you have more sugar running in your body which is a great source of energy you have the oxygen there you have everything going through and you have epinephrine there which is going to go everywhere else in your body too now, you've always heard someone say when someone else gets scared, wow, you're as white as a sheet or, uh, you know, you lost all your color. Well, the thing that ends up happening is when epinephrine goes to the capillaries of the skin, it, it contracts the blood vessels to get the blood to go stay away from the skin and go to areas that are larger, such as muscles. Now, the other thing it starts doing is it, it starts giving a lot more of your of your blood supply and your energy to large muscle groups at the same time inhibiting the smaller muscles. That means that fine motor skills tend to be lost a little. There is another reason for that. The other reason that the other thing that starts happening under the effect of epinephrine is muscles start getting excited and so they get get ready to contract. A lot of times they will start contracting and so the small muscles will cause a little twitch, a little and so you end up getting the shaking that you get when you're scared. You will find an increase of strength to a degree, uh, mostly because of the amount of sugar you're getting in, the fact that you don't feel a lot of different things. 
uh, epinephrine in nerves does tend to numb slightly the effect of pain. It also works really well to, with opioids to keep pain from being activated. That's why if you go into a surgical theater, a lot of times in anesthesia, they'll put epinephrine in there. Think about this. We talked about the Hulk gets affected by epinephrine. Everything goes off. His heart starts racing. His, his eyes change. His skin changes. And all of a sudden, he has all this power, all this strength. The really neat thing about the Incredible Hulk TV show and even in the comic books is rarely do they have him do really intricate things. Well, under the effects of rage, you're not going to be able to do intricate things. Martial artists. Well, it means that if you're teaching people how to get away with people by doing complex, small things, chances are the body will shut off the ability to do that. And so your technique ends up becoming worthless. Almost. Maybe there are some people who can actually overcome this, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So we now have epinephrine going through, and we can see how these changes a the Hulk. Uh, yes, you have heart rate, increased heart rate, you have increased blood pressure, you have that rage in your mind that pretty much is just trying to get you out by any means necessary. And that actually does explain the Hulk really well. If you're teaching martial arts, if you are scared, you're going to be in the effects of epinephrine. So yes, fine motor skills are going to be decreased. So you need to find a, a way to teach using big muscle groups only. It is not just the person who is uh, being attacked who's under the effect of epinephrine, but also the person who's doing the attacking. Now, a lot, a lot of people watch sports, and you can see how a lot of pe people before sports, they get themselves ready by, you know, getting angry and, you know, getting their muscles ready and do, sometimes doing rituals to get themselves pumped up. Well, one of the things that happens is the person who's going to attack you will probably end up having the, a similar ritual. So they will be pumped up a bit when they attack you. Now, a lot of people in martial arts will teach pain compliance techniques. There's a problem with this. You now have someone who's un, under the effect of epinephrine and may even have some opioid, uh, and I don't mean opium, I mean opioid, some of the endogenous uh, uh, hormones in your body that help numb pain. And so with these two together, a lot of the pain compliance will not work. There's a story in uh, Rory Miller's book about a prisoner who shatters his hands and didn't feel it until after the attack. Well, that's what you're going to get is you're going to get some people who may or may not be on drugs, but they will not necessarily feel these effects. So with that, I did. I hope I touched on a little bit on you know the Hulk, uh, you know how how he is getting these effects and how he's getting these things triggered. Uh, I know it's not exactly martial arts in that one, but I also hope that you can see why certain techniques they may they may make work excellent in the dojo, but when you go on the real world, you got to be careful because they may they if they are relying on pain or fine motor skills. They will not necessarily work. Now there is a special consideration, and that is people who have extreme amounts of training. One of the things there's actually a couple of articles on uh, snipers, and how when they are actually under fire, if they're having a gun and are looking, their blood pressure drops, and they actually their breathing changes to become a little more relaxed. It's not the trying to get all the air in. It's relaxed. And the reason has to do with training. They've actually trained themselves to switch. Instead of having the sympathetic fire, they end up going the other route. They end up relaxing enough so their fine motor skills work. And that is that is another thing that would be important to teach in martial arts is teach that, look, you know, if you can at all, try to get your par the parasympathetics to work and try to get your sympathetics to slow down. I hope this uh, helped people, and I hope it's something you enjoyed and can use. Uh, thank you for watching. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already done so. And feel free to share this with any of your friends or family, and you know, if you like. Have a good week.